Hi again. So in this screencast, I'm going to talk through how I put all my ideas together. And as I go, I will point out little bits of structure that you might want to jot down in terms of how you would like to structure your own ideas. So these are things that we would expect to see, such as topic sentences, linking sentences, your evidence, um, and things that might make it a bit easier when you are thinking about how to start your introduction or how to conclude your ideas. Okay, so just a refresher. The, I've put up the top because I like to continuously remind myself when I'm talking about my topic for my essay. So the quotes are, a gang of wild animals can be stopped simply because they're still human, said by Atticus in To Kill a Mockingbird. And while well, it's not easy to stand alone against the ridicule of others, so that's from 12 Angry Men and Drew and Nine says that when he changes his vote. The instructions are to compare what the two deck texts suggest about group dynamics. Remember, we're talking about what the authors suggest are the impacts or the, um, the effects of group dynamics. So introduction. My first sentence here I've introduced, remember it's always really important, you need to state what text you're talking about, you need to state the author and also state the form because one of them is a text and one of them is a novel. So my very first sentence here is pretty straightforward. I've just said what text I'm talking about. And I've also said the most obvious form of group dynamics. So the most obvious thing that I think that they both suggest about group dynamics. So both Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird and Reginald Rose's 12 Angry Men suggest group dynamics hold a dominant influence over a person's thoughts and behaviours. So pretty straightforward, but that is what I'm going to be talking about in paragraph one, how um, group dynamics easily influence our actions and our thinking processes. Don't forget when you're writing your essay that you, when you're handwriting it that you need to underline the title. It's a little fun fact for you. Okay, so second thing that I want to discuss, although yes, um, both texts do suggest that group dynamics have an influence over our thoughts and behaviours, both texts explore the power of moral sensibilities in combating prejudice and injustices. So that's my idea too that I'm going to be talking about. So we're going to talk about how um, even when we're in a group situation and it is quite influence over, over it is quite influencing over us, we can still be persuaded to see the wrong in our group or the wrong ideas that we're being told are right. However, so I've got yes, we can see that it does have a negative effect, but we can also see that these can our ideas can be influenced if there is someone there who is challenging our ideals our ideas sorry however lee's novel set in 1930 alabama features a distinct social hierarchy keeping citizens divided based on social standing so i'm just introducing lee's novel to kill a mockingbird in terms of its context of what's going on in society at that time so Lee's novel set in 1930s Alabama features a distinct social hierarchy keeping citizens divided based on social standing, income, and race. So that's the segregation within the town. So I want to look at the context of Rose's, uh, Reginald Rose's text. Sorry, it's a tongue twister. Reginald Rose's uh, film. So his film portrays a small portion of American society in 1957 through 12 men from lower to middle to middle class society. I really don't like that phrasing, but I'll fix that up another time. Oops. So I'm looking at how his setting is a little bit more diverse because he's got people from lower to middle who was the man who lives in the slums, but um, well, he's working in the slums, and there's also the middle class, um, more sophisticated society. So that's a little bit of context. So that's something a bit different. So I might do that blue. Then I've just got a statement of what I'm going to talk about, what I think the most important thing that they're suggesting about group dynamics is. The contrast in setting works to expose the unruly power social classes possess over individuals and the dire consequences for both justice and humanity if bigoted beliefs are not challenged. So that I think is the most important thing that both authors are portraying to the reader that um, our social classes do influence the justice system and they do influence our views on others. So that's a really important idea that both texts 
address. Okay, so in my introduction, I have introduced the authors, I've introduced the form, I think I have, yes, film. So I have Rose's film and Lee's novel. I've talked about the setting because in my third paragraph, I want to talk about the setting and the context. And I've talked about my three, well, I've introduced the three ideas I'm going to talk about. So paragraph one is going to talk about the most obvious thing, that yes, they group dynamics can influence an individual. A paragraph two, I'm going to talk about how um, moral sensibilities in combating prejudice and justice can be can break apart a group or have an individual within a strong group think about uh, the consequences of their actions. And then I want to talk about how the context of both of these texts and the prejudice views that are brought into the courtrooms and the jury rooms can have a big impact on justice. So I'm going to try and colour grade these. So that's my first idea, which is this paragraph here. And I've already gone through and highlighted the where I have used these quotes here. So I haven't used them exactly, like I haven't used that whole thing. I've just I've used that little bit. And then I've used that little bit. Not easy to stand alone and ridicule of others. You don't have to use them in big chunks. You want to draw the ideas from them rather than using the whole thing. Okay, paragraph one, the power of a peer group can possess over an individual, ugh, sorry, the power a peer group can possess over an individual is evident in both texts, as no personality proves insusceptible to influence when the goal of the group is believed to be just. So remember in the last video I talked about how I want to expose both really, um, I guess, just people, really um, humane and nice people can be influenced by groups as well as really dominant personalities can be influenced by a group. So I've said no personality proves insusceptible. Okay, and then I have got, I've started with To Kill a Mockingbird and I've tried to keep that, I've tried to start with To Kill a Mockingbird in each of them so it just keeps that nice um, fluency going throughout it. Uh, the upstanding Mr. Walter Cunningham and the antagonistic Jura 3. So I've purposely used adjectives there to describe the characters because I want you to recognise that they're contrasting characters. So the upstanding Mr. Walter Cunningham and the antagonistic Jura 3 appear juxtaposed in characterization. So initially when you are introduced to them, you probably wouldn't see any similarities between the two because they're characterised quite differently. However, both, when positioned within a group that believe their goal to serve a just outcome to the accused, so they both think that they're doing the right thing, prove the ease for an individual to lower their standards and disregard personal values. So this is still a part of my topic sentence because I'm outlining still what I'm going to be talking about. So remember that your topic sentence doesn't always have to do just one single sentence. It might take two sentences to um, outline your ideas. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to talk about Mr. Cunningham. Mr. Cunningham, a proud man who is defined by Atticus to come from a set breed of men, so it's one of the first times we're introduced to him, is quick to disregard the compassion shown to him by Atticus as he becomes fervent towards the group's desires to seek justice on Tom Robinson. The unlawful intent of the group is evident as they approach the jail surrounding Atticus before forcibly demanding, you know what we want, get aside from the door. Atticus's response indicates that these words come from Walter Cunningham as he pleasantly requests that Walter turn around and go home again. So he says, turn around and go home again, Walter. But that didn't flow nicely, so I swapped it around. Atticus's appeal does not affect Walter, and after the unexpected arrival of Scout, Dill, and Jem, Mr. Cunningham accepts the behaviour of a barely member of his gang as he grabs Jem roughly by the collar. So I thought that was really important because he has a child the same age as scout and so with such a um upstanding citizen you would think that he would not allow someone to roughly grab a child around the collar so you can see here that is the goal of the group and i think he has had a little bit to drink at this point so the goal of the group has become more important to him than um moral standing or standing up for children those sorts of things so Lee reveals the influence a group's self-appointed responsibility to serve rough justice can have on a seemingly respectable and reasonable man. 
Mr. Cunningham succumbs to the expected behaviour of this gang of wild animals by surrendering his personal values for the cause of the group. You can see here that he is a respectful and reasonable man. He has been said to be a set breed of men and as well I've said he's an upstanding character. So he's um, let go of all these things that he values in terms of being a good person and valuing the relationship with Atticus and he's let all of those go um, to serve what he believes to be justice to Tom Robinson. So here I'm going to move uh, on to the next text. So I've got really important my vocab. So in contrast to Lee's characterization of Mr. Cunningham, Rose introduces Juror 3 as a pugnacious character who immediately throws his influence on those who will listen. However, similar, so I've got some more there. So I've talked about how they're um, different. However, similar to Mr. Cunningham, Juror 3 possesses strong convictions. While Mr. Cunningham is careful to get along on what he has and respects those who allow him to do so, which is evident through um, his and Atticus's relationship, Juror 3 strongly believes that elders deserve respect. So that's his strong conviction there, that elders deserve respect. Visibly comfortable to find himself in the majority vote of 11 to 1 guilty, Juror 3, like Mr Cunningham, is quick to relinquish his values when consumed by the minority's focus. After viewing the elderly Juror 9 as sickening after voting guilty like everybody else and changing his vote after hearing the stories about a poor little kid who just couldn't help becoming a murderer, Juror 3 no longer sees 9 as an elderly worthy of respect. So here, similar to where I pointed out, um, Mr. Cunningham was starting to lose his sense of who he was. This is similar to Juror 9 in this aspect. No, sorry, Juror 3. So attacking Juror 9 the next time he speaks, Juror 6 steps in and reprimands a guy who talks like that to an old man ought to really get stepped on. So at this point we can really see that um, he's let go of the only uh, value that he brought into the juror room. So these words are pivotal for the reader to recognise Juror 3 has relinquished his personal values in place of full commitment to the outcome of a non-guilty verdict. Although Juror 3 is more openly antagonistic, sorry, both characters are willing to put aside their personal values and resort to intimidatory behaviour when positioned within a dynamic group. The initial contrast in characterisation of an upstanding, this is my linking sentence here, here. I'll do it the same colour, yellow. Uh, I kind of starts here because I've started to talk about um, the, I've kind of started to draw it together. So although Juror 3 is more openly antagonistic, both characters are willing to put aside their personal values. So I've drawn it all together there. Um, the initial contrast in characterization of an upstanding Mr. Cunningham and an antagonistic, so they're the um, adjectives that I used to describe them at the very start. I've just reinforced that idea that they both are quite different. Um, reveal the ease for any character to fall victim to the pressures of a group when committing themselves to a cause to believe to be seeking justice. So that is paragraph one. And they're the ideas that are, I think, the most obvious in terms of group dynamics, so that the group dynamics do have an influence over individuals. So paragraph two. Now, I've started with yep because I want, I want it to lead in nicely. I want you to think about, yes, this is evident that though both texts suggest that um, group dynamics do hold... Sorry, I'll start again. Yet... Though both texts suggest that the hold of a pig group can be strong, so I'm drawing on these ideas but building on them, Lee and Rose explore the human conscience and the influence integrity and reasoning can have on an already formed group's thoughts and behaviour. So I'm just going to go up and see what colour I did that green. Okay, so I'm saying even though... Beautiful. I'm saying even though um, group dynamics can have such an impact on you you are not it's that idea of we're still human so um it's really hard for us to let go of right and wrong and if someone approaches us and says 
or, you know, reasons why we're wrong, then it's, as humans, we do start to question the value of the group. I hope that makes sense. Anyway, both Atticus and Jura 8 are catalysts for the change seen in many characters within both texts as they evoke a sense of righteousness and weaken the dynamics of the majority. So that's a little bit of my topic sentence too because I've talked about how I've kind of led into my paragraph there. So Mr. Link D's, Tom's employer, is one of the members that Jem describes as a gang to visit the Finch house the night before the trial. Link questions Atticus as to why he touched the case in the first place. So remember, Link is the employer of Tom Robinson, and he later says that he's an upstanding bloke, not in those Australian words, and threatens that Atticus has everything to lose. So he says to Atticus, um, you're pretty much silly for taking this case. Although the men keep a civil tone, it is Atticus's subtle attack on Link's integrity as he suggests Link knows what the truth is that evokes an aggressive reaction from the group as the men draw nearer to him, causing Jem to scream out to Atticus. Unexpectedly, on the day of the trial, it is Mr Link Dees that stands up against the community as he interrupts the hearing to be a character witness for Tom Robinson. So we can see the change in attitudes willing to stand up at this point after um, he probably goes home, I'm interpreting, and reflects on the fact that he does know the truth and why is he not standing up to this man who he thinks, um, what does he say about him? I had it somewhere. I should have included it as evidence, but he says that pretty much he's a really good worker and a good person. What was I? So causing... Da, da, da. Um, unexpectedly, on the day of the trial, it is Mr. Link Dees that stands up against the community as he interrupts the hearing to be a character witness for Tom Robinson. Mr. Dees' detachment from the town views and his choice to speak up and support the minority reveals that any person with a conscience, there should be an A in there, any person with a conscience can be led to make righteous choices simply because they're still human. So I've drawn on that quote from the essay topic there and I've talked about that everyone well not everyone because um at the end of the text to kill a mockingbird there still are quite those prejudiced people but by being by having people question their actions or their thoughts because we are human we can be influenced to segregate ourselves from groups and do the right thing similar to atticus Jura 8 finds himself in the minority and the sole vote of not guilty so there's my comparative words there. I'm very repetitive with my comparative words, so try and mix it up. So you've got similar there as well. So don't be like me. Mix them up. Similar to Atticus, Jura 8 finds himself in the minority and the sole vote of not guilty. However, it is his nobility to just want to talk and give the boy on trial a few words that has drawn on respecting his motives and courage to stand alone against the ridicule of others resulting in a supporting vote for not guilty. Act 1, so there's some meta language there for you, Act 1 and Act 2, so it's using words that, um, meta language is language that helps you describe language. <laughs> um, act 1 says each change of vote come with a request from Jura 3 to explain what made them change their vote. However, as the group dynamics begin to evolve and characters resolve to take responsibility over their vote, Act 2 sees other jurors begin to demand a reason for the change. Juror 7, seemingly unconcerned with the outcome, looks at his watch and announces he has had enough. So at this point when I was writing, I realised I haven't really done much analysis. I haven't really drawn on um, the visual aspects of the film because that as well is your analysis. You need to look at how the author has used literary devices and film techniques and things like that to give meaning so I included the looking at his watch to show his lack of enthusiasm for the trial. So Jura 7 seemingly unconcerned with the outcome looks at his watch and announces he has had enough and changes his vote to not guilty. While Jura 3 immediately demands a reason for this change it is Jura 11 who challenges as challenges Jura 7 as to what kind of a man he is to change his vote because he is sick of all the talking. Jura 11 seen in Act 1 to respond to Jura's three question so repetitive with all these jurors, but we'll survive. So Act 1 
to respond to Drew Three's question with, I don't have to defend my vote to you, I have a reasonable doubt in my mind, now demands that Drew Seven has to justify why. So you can see that transition of attitudes there. So you can see, I didn't want that to highlight, but that's okay. Um, from Act 1 to Act 2, when Jura 11 changed his vote, he pretty much said, I don't have to justify it to you. But now he's saying to Jura 7 that you have to. So there's that change of attitude throughout the course of the text. This evolution in attitude shows it now to be a terrible and ugly thing to change your vote without being convinced. Although both Atticus and Jura 8 are not purposeful in influencing the views of others, so this is my linking sentence, I'm drawing my ideas together and saying why I'm even bothering to talk about this idea and how it links to the topic. Although both Atticus and Jura 8 are not purposeful in influencing the views of others, so they're doing it more for themselves, they both talk about their conscience and act in order to their conscience, there you go. The reader witnesses an evolution of change in the attitudes of many supporting characters as they move to question their actions and behaviours in turn and in turn the integrity of the group. Okay. Yes. All right. Paragraph three, which is quite lengthy, I'm sorry, but there was lots to talk about in that paragraph. So this is the one in con the contrast in setting work to expose the unruly social classes possess over individuals and the dire consequences for both justice and humanity if bigoted beliefs are not challenged. Okay. I think I, think I did a pink. All right. Paragraph three, topic sentence. So it's really no different to your essays that you write for uh, text response because this is a text response you're just comparing two texts so you have your topic sentence you have evidence in there you're explaining your evidence and you're linking your ideas back so both lee and rose suggest that the most influential and powerful groups are those permeated within everyday society the segregation of race race <laughs> social standing and income proved to impact both the human spirit and the justice system so I'm going to talk about Tarbo Newman first because I've been following that structure. Scout's introductory depiction of Mayhem alludes to Franklin D. Roosevelt's first inaugural address where it is promised that the country battered by the Great Depression have nothing to fear but fear itself. Although aiming to evoke a sense of optimism, these words foreshadow the extreme consequences when fear enhanced by bigotry and unquestioned assumptions, obscure the truth. So you can see I've got that obscure the truth, which was one of my, um, one of the ideas that was drawn out from that quotation that I really liked. From 12 Angry Men. <coughs> the Makem social hierarchy reveals itself through the course of the text with the Yules labelled as the disgrace of Makem for three generations. However, the response from the community to Tom Robinson's trial, so here I wanted to point out the fact that they're always so negative about the Yules um, in the exposition of the text, so at the beginning of the text. However, the response from the community to Tom Robinson's trial epitomises the attitudes towards African Americans in the 1930s. So I'm talking about the context here. As Atticus reveals the case to evoke Maycomb's usual disease of town folk going stark crazy mad when anything involving a Negro comes up. Despite the vast contrast in characterization as Mayala and her family live like animals and Calpurnia declares Tom to be of clean living folk. So I've even used my comparative vocab there to actually look at um, comparisons within the actual text. Racial fallacy leads Makem to believe Attica should do, shouldn't do much about defending this man. So the contrast here of living like animals and uh, clean living folks really, I think, highlights the views towards African Americans at this time. Okay, so however, it is Atticus's closing defence argument where Lee exposes Makem to be the true offenders of justice. Atticus declares, I shouldn't have that there, sorry. Atticus declares the case to be as simple as black and white. However, this double entendre, I think I pronounced that right, entendre, 
challenge, which means that it has two meanings behind it, simple as black and white. So he's saying um, it's quite obvious, but he's also challenging them by saying it's as simple as racism. However, this double entendre challenges the social classes and the generalisation of groups within Maycomb as he argues his case should never have come to trial. Atticus's repetitive reference to our society works to challenge the reader as to whether the trial is the fault of Mayala, a victim of cruel poverty and ignorance, or a society that will further isolate an individual for merely breaking a rigid and time on a code as she tempted and kissed, kissed a black man. Lee exposes the power man-made social classes possess over justice when members of the Maycomb community go along with evil assumptions and that all, sorry, that all Negroes are criminals as Tom is found guilty of a crime where the evidence is the testimony of two witnesses that has been called into serious question. Okay, so I've analysed text one, now I'm going to go into text two. So similar to, to Lee, the author, Rose, the author of 12 Anger Men, exposes the influence social classes can have on justice. However, the setting of 12 Anger Men allows the reader to witness these within the confines of a jury room. The exposition immediately reveals a divide between classes as juror 10 confides in juror 12 that it is difficult to imagine a son murdering his father, however, declares it's those people so those words, those um, generalising words, those people, and maybe it serves them right. This attitude towards the defendant's community suggests his vote is based on a negative assumption of a lower class. This attitude is heightened once the first vote reveals Juror 8 to believe we owe him a few words, whereas Juror 20 is, 10 is quick to retort that we don't owe him a thing and that the boy is lucky he got a fair trial at the cost of the community. Differing to the town of Maycomb, these prejudicial views on class are openly challenged. So differing to Maycomb because um, in Maycomb these are not openly challenged. They're challenged by Atticus, but like in his, up here where I've said in his closing argument, he's challenged that, but they're not. The townsfolk are too scared that like I said, fearful, too scared to challenge the ideals of society. These prejudicial views on class are openly challenged, however, like Maycomb, these views are strongly ingrained and are therefore difficult to silence. So there's the differing and then there's the um, similarities, so like. Um, in Act 2, these negative assumptions on class come to a climax as Juror 10 fears the release of the defendant after the votes increase 9 to 3 in favour of not guilty. In a fit of rage, Juror 10's monologue reveals deeply ingrained assumptions about the slums. So I've tried to include as much um, meta language as I can. So words that show that you have an understanding of how the author has constructed the text. So we've got things like monologue and how I tried to explain in meta language before. It's language that just um, that you use words that you use to explain language it's with the worst definition, but it's words like monologue, act two, novel, text, the reader, those sorts of things. Um, in a fit of rage, Jura Ten's monologue reveals deeply ingrained assumptions about the slums. As the camera zooms away, so I've tried to use a bit of film technique there. So as the camera zooms away from an angry Jura Ten and slowly brings into focus, because you need to think they're things that the director has done purposefully to give you a little bit of emotion or deeper meaning into the events that are occurring. So think about those things because they're the things that show that you have a really good understanding of why the text was constructed that way. Uh, the other juror, the viewer, is forced to recognise the effect prejudicial views can have on those around them. I found that quite challenging to explain, but what I was trying to say is that while he's yelling and expressing these views, the people are around them are hearing them, and I still can't explain it properly, but some people, it's the way that even in society, if you're saying these really racist things, some people might, like younger people, pick up on these things and then they might, I'm just going to stop talking, but then they start to have those views as well. Um, and you might offend someone else and you might, um, yeah, anyway. 
I tried to explain it as best I could. Juror 5 has lived in the slums all his life and is the first to remove himself from the tables. This is what I'm trying to say, that um, this is the effect that it's having on people. People are starting to move away from the table. So Juror 5 has lived in the slums all his life and in the, is the first to remove himself from the table and turn his back on the fictitious fact. So I had to point out that it wasn't fact. So it's a fictitious fact. It's his assumption, but I wanted to use the word fact because that is what he said. He said it's the fact that these people have gone to lie. As Juror 10 continues to press his views, each juror steps up from the table and moves away to turn his back on these negative assumptions of lower class citizens. So remember that evidence is not always quotes. It's not always quotes from a text or quotes from a movie. Um, evidence can be the scene where they all move away. You just need to explain what's occurring and why. Um, Juror 3 remains at the table. However, when Juror 10, seemingly defeated, pleads for him to listen, Juror 3, a fellow supporter of the guilty vote, asserts, I have. Now sit down and don't open your mouth again. The silence within the courtroom encourages the viewer to recognise the ability for a group to band together against prejudice and silence aggressive assumptions. However, it is Juror 8's words that prejudice can obscure the truth. So that's my quote that I really like that relate heavily to the events of Tom Robinson's trial and challenge the effectiveness of the justice system if assumptions about social class are not challenged. So my linking sentence there. But it's really important that you can see um, phrases from other texts sometimes link to, like here, prejudice can obscure the truth, although there's a positive outcome for that phrase in 12 Angry Men. That quote is also really important to Kill a Mockingbird because prejudice does obscure the truth. So just because those words aren't from the text doesn't mean that they don't have a meaning or a connection to another text. Okay, so they're my paragraphs. So now I need to draw it all together. So it's really important in your conclusion that you give like an insightful comment, something that you think is really important that both authors wanted you to take away from it and what you want your reader to take away from your ideas from the essay. So remember to... Um, introduce the authors again, so just sort of bring it nicely together. So both Harper Lee and Reginald Rose address the societal norms to categorise and class individuals according to social standing, income and race. So I'm saying that we, it's just a society thing. We always segregate and class people because of differences or similarities. By exposing the ease of an individual to be influenced when in a group dynamic, the reader is left questioning the effectiveness of the jury system as prejudices prove difficult to disregard. And Jura 8 has actually explicitly said that prejudice can obscure the truth. However, it is Atticus and Jura 8 that prove the possession of moral conscience and belief in humanity can work towards a less segregated and more just society. So I'm saying that that is what I think we need to take away from this, a really positive outcome that... Um, Although To Kill a Mockingbird has a really neg like a really sad ending in terms of the court case, Jura I mean Atticus Miss Morty says that it is one small step, not in that exact words, but she says something like it is a small step and we're working towards a more just society. And it's similar in Twelve Angry Men. So I think that's something really nice that we can take away from both of them. That if we continue to be moral and to believe in humanity, then we'll always have the hope that we will live in a more just society. And that is my essay. Good luck with writing yours.